Well, if there ever was such a thing as a legend within the field of conspiracy research and controversial truth-seeking, our special guest today is certainly one of those legends. Hello and welcome to this edition of Age of Truth TV. I'm Lucas Alexander in Boulder near Denver, Colorado. It's the 20th of January 2018 and our guest is author and lecturer Jordan Maxwell. Thank you very much, Jordan Maxwell, for joining us for this interview for Age of Truth TV. It's wonderful that you would invite us to come here to your house in Colorado. Well, thank you for thinking enough of me to want to interview me. I appreciate that. You've been doing so much work revealing secrets about this global conspiracy for 60 years almost, and you've been let's say, the first one on this scene? All I remember is back in 1959 and 60, I was giving lectures at little small venues like mom and pop uh, bookstores and little libraries and just little groups uh, where I'm talking about uh, secret societies and the international banking cartels, etc., etc. But that was... That's, what, uh, 58 years ago? How did you already know about these things at because that time? I have always been interested, even as a kid, in secrets. I knew adults are not telling me everything. And I knew that, because I know it from my own family. And, uh, and so I would ask adults, as I was growing up, questions, very penetrating, sometimes personal stuff. And they would give me a nice little pat answer. And I know they're lying to me. And you were a skeptic from yeah. an early, yeah. early time. But I was on. a skeptic not of phenomena that I live with, and not the world, but people. And so I started delving into all kinds of dark places. And I grew up from, I'd say, about five, six, seven years old begin to have strange experiences in my life. I would, you know, startling stuff would happen to me really? as a kid. Yeah, I would wake up in the middle of the night and see uh, see things in my room moving. Like and, what? Things? Uh, oh, yeah, objects? yeah. I, I had entities. I, I don't know what else to call them. It was just entities in my bedroom at night. And then I would, you know, I would, I, you know, go to my eyes and think, what am I seeing? And then it moves over. I was never frightened by it, but I realized that there's another world that I, you know, that not, this is not just my world here, there's another world. It's not just the world you live in. I was born, born and raised Catholic, and so at nine or 10 years old, uh, you are confirmed in the Catholic Church. If you're 19 years old, you have a, a ritual you have to go through. It's called confirmation. Mm -hmm. And so uh, at the confirmation the day before, I was in the Catholic school, and the day before, the nuns, the teachers told us, now tomorrow at the confirmation service, tomorrow night, uh, after the service is over, uh, the bishop will be there, and he might possibly, maybe not, but he might possibly ask you children, all of you children, if you have any questions, uh, you know, that he'll try and answer them for you. And so when that happens, remember, you don't ask any questions. You just keep your mouth shut. You don't have any questions. And so the next night, the bishop was there, and he said, now that you children are Catholics and the confirmation service is over, if you have any questions, I'll try and answer them for you. And so I stood up, knowing, all the kids knew, you don't have any questions. So I stood up in my arrogance. I stood up. I want everybody to know who I am. <laughs> and I said, yes, uh, Bishop, I have a question. I said, my father works with torches, like a welder. And if I held a torch and it was on fire, 
and an angel appeared to me. Could I hit the, uh, burn the angel with a torch? Would it hurt him? Wow. And he says, well, no. And I said, why not? And he said, well, because angels are spirits, and, and you can't even see a spirit, much less burn one. Mm -hmm. And then he went on to say, you know, fire is a natural thing. Like, you need paper or plastic or wood to burn. You can't just burn anything. You, and I said, well, then why am I told that I'm going to go to hell where my spirit will burn forever? You can't burn a spirit. That's, that's a good point. Yeah, at nine wow. years old. Oh, great. What did he answer? Yeah, and so he, he started muttering and, and trying to figure out what he was going to say. And there was a little Irish priest, very red-haired an Irish priest, standing very close to where I was. And, he, and this priest said to me in front of everyone, you yeah, sit down and shut up. Sit down. So I did. But then I thought to myself, I know what's going on here. Mm -hmm. And you knew it wasn't real you, you knew it wasn't the truth what that they are teaching people. i was watching everything i'm watching their mannerisms i'm watching what they're doing i'm watching their interplay and personalities between people mm -hmm. how the priests were always very subservient to the bishop mm -hmm. and the bishop was always very subservient to the people and i'm thinking now this is a game you're playing and i'm not buying right. it and so I started asking questions at 9, 10, 11 years old, and adults were not answering my questions. It's interesting that you were a Catholic, because what we've seen in the last 10 or 20 years maybe, mm -hmm. is a lot of dark secrets coming out about what is going on, especially in the Vatican. And you've and talked... And they're far more darker yet than you know. Really? Far more darker than you even suspect. Could you please start going into that, um, well, I don't th that think alley? <laughs> I don't think that's very safe for me doing that. But, really? Uh, you have spoken about what is happening in the Vatican. First of all, I always try and say that I am not the world's foremost authority on anything. I am smart enough to know how much I don't know. But I'm also smart enough to know that you're not going to be perfect on everything. So sometimes maybe it's just your opinion and your opinion may be wrong. And so I try and, and, and tell people that I'm not the world's foremost authority. I prefer to think of myself as just an ordinary man pursuing extraordinary knowledge. But now you're actually, I hope, we can reveal your age. <laughs> yes, I'm 77. As of December, this past December, I am now 77 years old. Wow. I feel like 120, <laughs> but I'm 77. <laughs> wow. And what I'm, what's really interesting to me because is Because you've done so much. I scare myself thinking about all the strange places I've been. And people you've known. And people I've known. And, and yet I'm still alive. I will give you my opinion on yes. the world scene today. Yes. I believe, uh, I, it's just my belief, based on 58 years of experience, I believe that there is a concerted, organized, conspiratorial movement in the world, and I refer to it the way it refers to itself as the World Revolutionary Movement. Most people have never heard that term, but it's called the World Revolutionary Movement. And basically it is the power, the political power and the money and the, and the wherewithal to make things happen in the world that's behind all sides. The, the communists are, are, are being promoted, financed, organized and directed by somebody, while the Nazis and Adolf Hitler was being financed and directed by somebody. And then you find out that the, that the, the, the Mormon church becomes very powerful and a lot of money and prestige, and the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Seventh-day Adventists and Scientology, all of the major religions in the world, somebody is financing them Somebody knows what's going on, and it's not what you think. And so when you begin to see the, the major religious movements in the world, 
and Jehovah's Witnesses is, are, is one cult that I know about. I know things about the Jehovah's Witnesses most people will never be privy to know. Really? Yes. Like what? For instance, uh, I went out to dinner back in 19, I don't know what it was, 67, 68, in Los Angeles. There was a big Jehovah's Witness uh, uh, um, convention, big one. And so three of the, what, what they call the governing body, the 12 men who sit in New York City, who governed the whole movement of Jehovah's Witnesses, well, three of them were there in Los Angeles, and I happened to be in their company with them. And, and my, my dear friend, a young friend my age, was part of family with one of them. So he got to go where his uncle, who was on the governing body, and since I was his close friend, he could always get me in to go. And so I went to dinner with the uh, three members of the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses. You're observing. Yeah, just observing. Mm -hmm. When the conversation finally quieted down, I asked one of the members of the governing body, once a year you put out a yearbook telling the world what you've done and what you're doing and all that. And in the yearbook this year it says something to the effect that the Watchtower Society has paid out in salaries over $67 million, which does not account for all the money that they're buying land and property and printing presses and, and, you know, and big properties in Europe and opening up big, big operations and printing operations in Asia and all that's all big money. But they said they had just paid out $67 million in just salaries alone for construction, for people who are doing things for them. That's a lot. That's a lot of money. And so I said to him, I, I'm aware of Jehovah's Witnesses in Los Angeles, and some of the wealthiest areas where Jehovah's Witnesses are, are they tell me they're having problems just paying their rent. Oh, so yeah. they didn't spend the money, yeah. money or and get so, it. And so the Jehovah's Witnesses who are living in Beverly Hills, are in these wealthy areas, but they're telling me that they're, they're, just because they're in a wealthy area, that doesn't mean they're filthy rich. And so they are having problems paying their rent and paying utilities and things. Right. And so I said, Jehovah's Witnesses are not known as being a wealthy, powerful no. organization. No. And yet they're buying properties all over the world. They're buying uh, uh, printing presses. That's not cheap. And they're paying out sixty-seven million in just you know just salaries alone. Where are you getting the money? That's what I'm curious about. Because right. uh, uh, all the witnesses I know in wealthy areas here in L.A. they don't have anything. They, they're struggling just to pay the bills like everybody else. There was a young man, young Greek boy, but he I didn't realize was the chief uh, accountant for the Watchtower Bible Tract Society. He's the chief accountant. Mm -hmm. So I said, so where, is the, uh, where are the Jehovah's Witnesses getting this money? Mm -hmm. And he said to me, uh, in front of everyone, he said, we have two corporate accounts. One is, more, uh, is, Chase, uh, is the Chase Bank in New York, Rockefeller's Bank. And another one is the, uh, uh, what is it in Philadelphia? J.P. Morgan, Morgan Guarantee Trust. Back then it was Morgan Guarantee Trust in Philadelphia and, and, and Rockefeller Bank in New York. And I said, so... So they were said, funding the yeah, Jehovah's Witnesses? That's right, they fund Jehovah's really? Witnesses. Really? So he said, so I said, explain that to me. Uh, he said that we have an open account with those two banks. And I said, what does that mean, open account? And he said, basically it means once a year they give us a checkbook. And whatever you write is covered. That's simple. Oh, how and convenient. Very. And I said, you mean on the, on the, on the scale that Je uh, Jehovah's Witness Watchtower spends money? They're writing out millions of dollars in checks and it's covered? And he to said, whom? To the uh, people in the administration? Yeah, the administration of Jehovah's Witnesses, the, the governing body, the, the New York headquarters. Well, when they write checks, those are big checks. Well, he just got to telling me that 
it's covered, don't worry about it. Whatever you write, it's covered. So I thought to myself, wait a minute. I, I didn't say anything, but it, it struck me that Jehovah's Witnesses are always talking about this evil world and all these evil people and the bankers and the evil government. And yet it's the Rockefellers and J.T. Morgan that are financing you. Why would they do that, the Rockefellers and J.P. Morgan? Because Jehovah's Witnesses, like all the other York Wright uh, religious systems, um, they're referred to as York Wright systems, are preparing the people around the world to accept a political establishment which is coming. And the political government which is coming, it's not here quite yet, is going to be promoting that they are from God, it's God's kingdom. And God is bringing a new, wonderful, new order to the world. It's called the New, new world, world Order. The New World Order. That's what it says in the Watchtower publications. Many, many times in Watchtower, Watchtower publications, it talks about the coming New World Order in which the Lord himself, God, will, will oversee this new government and there will be a wonderful new way to live and no more war, it's all going to be wonderful and the Rockefellers and the Rothschilds are paying for it. You like that? <laughs> and I thought, no, no, something's wrong here. So that was the beginning of my beginning to find out what's really going on here in the world. And now, today, it is my opinion that there is not one single religion, not a political or spiritual philosophy like Hindus or Buddhists. These are philosophical systems. Mm -hmm. But I'm talking about actual churches. Organized. Organized churches. Catholics. All of those churches, mm -hmm. synagogues, mosques, all of these different major institutions, Jewish, Muslim, Christian, are all corporations on the stock market. Hmm? They're all corporations. Money. So how would you describe the New World Order? What exactly is that? We've heard presidents and world leaders and, and figures, political figures, talk about the New World Order for many years. And it's actually all over the world that they talk about that. But why do they do that? A lot of people still don't know what the New World Order is or haven't even been listening when they mention it. Yeah. yeah. And I have been called many times. I have been called a, uh, a conspiracy theorist. No. Correctly understanding, I'm a conspiracy analyst. I'm analyzing the world I live in. What I do today used to be called a journalist, uh, in an investigative reporter, someone who spent many years reading and studying and researching a particular organization or a particular subject. And then one day they write a major book on the subject. Why? Because they know what they're talking about. They've been looking at it for all, uh, many, many years. Mm -hmm. And so they were referred to as research analysts. And the government is very concerned about research analysts because the U.S. government, like all other governments, have things like the CIA, Central Intelligence Agency. Because governments don't care if you're a believer. You go to a church or go to a synagogue or whatever, and, the, and you're referred to as a believer. Governments don't care what you believe. Freedom of, freedom of religion. They don't care what you believe. They want to know what you're doing. They don't care what you believe. So they have organizations called CIA, Central Intelligence Agency. They don't want to hear what you believe. They want to know who you really are. How much money do you really have and what are you doing behind the scene that government don't know about? We don't care what you believe. They want intelligence. And so that's why I say, I'm not interested in what you believe. I want to know. I want proof. And so that's why there's a big difference today between being a believer and somebody who has done his homework. 
It's, But very yeah. often when people like you and others talk about things that are so otherworldly and out there and wild mm. for a lot of people they they just can't take it in. <laughs> right. How uh, they will say how can you Jordan Maxwell prove what you're saying? I mean maybe not necessarily about the new world order and yeah, that yeah. structure because it's more say if we can say down to earth but if we're no longer down to earth and we go into space and alien races and all of these things that we also want to cover today I understand. then how can you prove that that's right and I understand and I would suspect that that's a very good question I don't have any problem with that my answer would be that I don't need to prove it. I am just an ordinary man pursuing extraordinary knowledge. And I have been in the company of very powerful people that you don't know that I know. And I've had conversations that you were not privy to know about. And so I don't need to prove anything. And they revealed that there are Sometime. things going on in the universe that we are certainly not being told here on Earth? Obviously. I have had events in my life that I was there and I was an eyewitness to, that I saw with my own eyes, and I know who they were, they, uh, who they were, I saw what they did, and they know that I was there and saw them. And can you reveal some of that? Uh, I don't think so, <laughs> uh, because, because I could tell you some stories about very famous people that will, uh, that, uh, will probably get me hurt. When I talk about extraterrestrials and, and, yes. and, and, and UFOs and all that kind of thing, I've had experiences where I was there with other people, with my friends. And did you see and, some of that? And I was there when it happened. Oh. So that's why it, it doesn't bother me when someone asks me, well, how can you prove that? My answer to that is, I don't need to prove it, son, I was there. Have you seen what is called a UFO or a oh, spaceship? Oh, have I ever, have I ship? ever. Have you seen uh, any alien races, a, a species from other planetary systems? Uh, let me tell you a story that happened to me when I was 19 years old. Mm -hmm. I moved to Los Angeles from Florida. And so I had a room, and, and I was in North Hollywood, and so I, I only lived two blocks from downtown. So on Saturdays, I'd walk downtown to have breakfast and, and hang around town. And so I walked into the restaurant one day, uh, 1959, and there was crowded, uh, the, the place was crowded, no, no room at all, except one, one chair at the counter. So I sat down at the counter, and there was a girl sitting next to me. I'm 19, she was probably 17 or so. And so we started talking, I liked her, she liked me, and so then after breakfast, breakfast we got up and took a walk down the street, we went to a movie, and so we started meeting on Saturdays. One night, on a Friday night, she came and knocked on my door, and she said, uh, my dad wants to talk to you. And I said, I'm not interested to talk to your dad. Okay. I don't, I, nothing I need to talk to your father about. Mm. And she said, my dad is a very important man, and he has something he wants to tell you. The moment I saw him, involuntarily, I got this strange feeling, the, the, the hair raised up in the back of my neck, I, I got a strange feeling about him. And I know this is not a normal man. Uh, and, but I was, uh, it was involuntary. I didn't want to feel this way. It's just uh, my, my spirit was reacting to his presence. And then he said to me, he said, remember back in Florida when you were back in Florida at home and your dad built a new back porch? Remember when he tore down the old back porch and built a new one? And that scared me. And I didn't want to show tears in front of my girlfriend, but he scared me. How would he know? What, But my dad did build a new back porch. <clears throat> and he said to me... And you hadn't told the girl? No, that. no, never told her. Why would I need to tell my girlfriend about my dad building a new back well, porch? Well, ordinary talk. No, no. And so when he said that, it scared me. And he said that one night, one night you were about eight years old, and one night you got up and you were not supposed to, you were supposed to be in bed sleeping, but you got up and you went on the back porch at, late at night, and the moon was full. Remember that night you went out on the back porch in the full moon? And that really scared me, because I 
But I was thinking, how much more does he know about my personal life? And he said to me, remember when you were on the back porch, the green lumber your dad had used because it was cheap, but it was green lumber and it smelled funny at night. And you remember how you picked it with your thumb? Remember that when you picked the wood and you put it in your mouth like picking your teeth and you were smelling it because it smelled funny? And I said, yes, I did. And he said, I know. We were there. And I said, who's we? And he said, you asked to do something with your life. Why are you here in Los Angeles? Why did you come here? And I said, I don't know. I just needed to come. I just, it was a, 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 a passion to come to Los Angeles. And he said, that's right. We brought you here. After all, you said you wanted something to do, so we brought you here to Los Angeles so you can do something. After all, you asked God, so we're giving you a chance. And I said, who is we? And he said, you've always been interested in UFOs and aliens and otherworldly subjects, haven't you? And I said, yes, very. And he said, yeah, I know. We've been watching you. And he said, you, uh, would you like to see some UFOs up close tonight? And I said, yeah, I would love that. And, he said, that. and then he said it this way. He said, well, that I can do for you. Come with me. Mm -hmm. And I said, where are we going? He said, we're going to see the UFOs. You said you wanted to see them. Well, come with me and I'll show them. And so the two girls got up and I looked at my girlfriend and she's looking very uh, interesting look on her face like, yeah, this is my father, mm -hmm. this is him. And so we went out in the front, front yard and this was about midnight, back in 1959, midnight in North Hollywood. And he looks up into the, the sky and starts inaudibly talking. He's moving his mouth, he's talking, but you can't hear him. And then he turns to me and he said, they said that, that they're coming from the Griffith Park area going north and that they'll be coming over the mountain right here in just a, just a minute or so. Didn't you ask him at that time who he was? No, no. So I, 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 I was just, I was watching what he's doing. And, and within about a minute or so, for sure, they, they, they had three of them, three beautiful disc-shaped craft whatever they were. They came from the Griffith Park area, they came over and they stopped right over the top of us in, in, a, in a triangle formation. And, and, and they were- But they the, were round? They were like round, -shaped. But, but they were round, but the bottom of each one was like a pie cut in six or eight slices. And each slice was a different color. And, but they were laser colors, not just regular colors, laser colors. But in 1959, I didn't know what laser was. All I know is that these colors are profound. The greens were brilliantly green, and the orange was phenomenally orange. And so they were, now I know, they were laser colors. And they were circulating, but not so fast as to, as to join the colors. But they're, they're brilliant colors circulating on all three. But what's important is that all three of these craft were full moon size, not just little lights, full moon size right over the top of us. And I'm standing there with the two girls and the father, and we're looking at these beautiful, gorgeous things, whatever they were. And, and Did I they give out him. a feeling? Huh? Oh God, yeah, I had a strange feeling that, who is this man who can, talk to the sky and UFOs show up. What man can do such a thing? Right, we want to know. <laughs> and so I want to know. And he turns to me and he said, they're beautiful, aren't they? And I said, they're gorgeous. But what is this I'm seeing? He said, that's us. You're seeing us. And you, know, you said you wanted to serve God. Well, we're going to let you. And so we have But some... what does God have to do with, with... what an alien species or whatever you... That's what he we, said. We want to know He's, who he was now. Yeah, because he said, you talked to God, and you said you wanted to, God to let you do something important. Well, we brought you out here so you can do something important. So in my mind, as a 19-year-old, because I'm not stupid, I started, started to think, wait a minute, there's something going on here that I, I'm not fully aware of how, what this guy's talking about. But he does speak to the sky and UFOs show up mm -hmm. and he knows everything about me and my life. 
I'm fascinated who this guy really is. How does he do what he does? Yeah. And so my whole, my whole idea about God is rapidly changing in my spirit. Mm -hmm. I don't know what we're talking about here when you talk about God. All I know is God is dog sparrow back. And did you find out? We'd go out there and roam around way out in the desert. He would tell me about all the extraterrestrial life forms that are here, where they're from, and who's, uh, where, they're, where they're living. And he would, we'd go out and look at the mounds, and he would tell me the different alien groups that are here on the earth. We want to talk about that also, yeah, what you've discovered so, in the last 60 years about that. But who did he say he was? He never told me who he was. He just said. And you never asked. I don't think I ever asked. I really? just listened. I just listened. How, how could you not do that when UFOs appear? And he's saying things that you've done to totally in yeah. privacy. But I, I, I'm, I'm enthralled with him, and so I'm just listening. He's, But do you think he was uh, an extraterrestrial? That's what I think. That's my I But think. he looked human. Yeah, it took a perfectly human. But that's what the Bible says. The Bible says that uh, that the that the gods. Uh, uh, they look human. But who, but who wrote the Bible? Well, I don't know. Well, what I'm is the saying, Bible? I is think the Bible by? is is a very interesting and profound book. But I understand it because I've been looking at it for 58 years. And I've talked to all the professionals. But it's written in code, isn't it? Yeah, I know, and I'm the one who talks about that. I'm just telling you that there's a deeper story there. I believe that the Old and the New Testament are metaphors. Uh, spiritual stories that are metaphors and if you're looking at the Bible as history then you don't understand you don't get it but if you're looking at this Bible with spiritual eyes and knowing it's telling you something but it's a metaphor it's a symbolic story mm -hmm. because that the Bible has Jesus saying many will look with their eyes but not see they will listen with their ears but not hear and with the heart not get the sense of it And so I'm saying that's exactly right. There's something in the Bible, but you don't mm -hmm. see it. It's a metaphor. It's a symbolic message of symbols. And if you understand the symbolic message, now it gets scary. Because now it's real. Now you can finally see it. That's why when you educate someone, they say, oh, I see what you mean. What do you mean you see what I mean? Yeah. Well, I, I get it. I, I get you what, understand it. Yeah, I understand it. Uh -huh. Well, how do you understand? You stand under the foundation. If you, uh, you know, you, uh, you're going to build on the second floor, you know, go down the first floor and see if the, see if the foundation is going to hold what you're going to do on the second floor. So now you're standing under the foundation to get understanding. That's where the word comes from. Right. To stand under a subject. And now you understand. And so I understood that he has knowledge and can do things I can't, and I love being around him because it was fascinating. Mm -hmm. uh, I learned so much from him. I didn't feel required to ask him, where are you from and who are you? He was my friend, my girlfriend's father. And you uh, had been very inquisitive, though, yeah. since oh, your childhood. I was very inquisitive up here. But you couldn't ask him. Was it something that blocked you from asking him, or what was that? Nope. I just never, uh, it just never occurred to me to ask him, wow. where are you from and who are you? But in the Bible, for example, we talk about the Garden of Eden. Yeah, no, no, but, but that's all symbolic. It all has to do with but metaphors. Can we, but can we talk about the symbolism behind that particular uh, section well, of the Bible? Well, what you need to know, what you need to know about the Bible right off the bat is Genesis 1-1 in the, in the English Bible, the King James Bible, does not say what it says in Hebrew. It, it does not say what you so think. So it's been it's rewritten. Written. It's been rewritten, retranslated, and it's all screwed up. Mm -hmm. And so uh, in, the, in, in the King James today, you will read uh, Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's not what it says in the Hebrew. It doesn't say that. And so I talked with one of the leading rabbis back in 1960 to 65, was a dear friend of mine, and we used to talk all the time, and he was a very powerful rabbi in America. And I asked him, and he said, nowhere in the Bible does it say God created man. That's Christian ideas, but the, the, the Bible doesn't say that. It's just a story that is written to 
to control people or to, well, maybe to make not. them believe, or, or believe is, something in a certain direction. That's right. How many different alien species and races do you know of or heard of or been told I have heard, about? I have heard and I have heard from people who should know, who are in a position to know, and they tell me there's over 50. Over 50? Over 50. And who are the most powerful alien races? Are they all bad? or good, and who is working with, let's say, the government? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, and I've, I've, had, I've had experts uh, tell me their opinion and basically what, what they know. I, I can't swear by it, but I've had experts who should know, and they tell me there's over 50, and that, uh, and that most of them look human. Most of them look yeah. human. But, but there are others who don't, and there are others who are not physical, others who are energy fields, and, and they can... They're interdimensional? Interdimensional, exactly, that's the word. The Bible basically says, if you read it, it says that, uh, that we were created by aliens. That's what it says. And, uh, and so, but those aliens said in Genesis 1.28 when God is, well, let me go back and lay the foundation because it's a big story, but basically Genesis 1.1 is not correct. It says in, in the King James, uh, uh, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. But in Hebrew, the word God is E-L. L is God in Hebrew. So therefore, if you go back to the original Hebrew and read it, it should say, in the beginning, El created the heavens and the earth, because El is God. But it doesn't say that. It doesn't say El created the heavens and the earth. It says, in the beginning in Hebrew, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. Well, that's different. What does that mean? Well, Elohim is a plural. Just like in English, you have a C-A-R, a car, you put a comma and an S becomes more than one. Cars. Well, in Hebrew, Elohim is a plural, which means it should be correctly translated, in the beginning, the gods created the heavens and the earth. And so then later on, when we're talking about God creating Adam and Eve, no, it's not God. The gods created Adam and Eve. And what does it say in Genesis about God creating the heavens and the earth? It says, the God said, come let us, come let us make man in our image after our likeness. And so the rabbi told me that, and, and so I said, well, doesn't, doesn't that say that God created man? No, it does not say God created man. The rabbi said, go back and read it correctly. It says, the gods, the gods, more than one, said, come, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Not make man, but let us make man in our image, after our likeness. How do you do that? We'll mess with his DNA. We'll mess with his whole his whole system of reproduction, the sexual system to reproduce. And so they recreated us. They have said, come let us make man in our image, after our likeness. So humans were there before? That's right. Humans were there way before. Way before, hundreds and then they were changed? Hundreds of millions of years. Hundreds of millions, if not in point of fact, billions. Humans. And the reason I would say the, this earth has been the home of highly intelligent life forms for billions of years. Why do I say that? Because in Africa alone, along with other places in the world, uh, mining companies have dug down into the earth many, many miles. And all of paleontology and archaeologists will agree, uh, all agree across the board, that at a certain depth down that far, that strata is at least three and a half billion years old. When you go that far down, you're in strata, which is three and a half billion years old. All scientists agree. But at that depth, they're finding handmade artifacts, 
handmade artifacts melt, melted and made into rings or, or strange little designs at that depth, which should tell you that somebody was here at three and a half billion years ago creating handmade artifacts. So when you want to talk about the history of the earth, you need to go back and do your homework. Does it have to be billions of years? It could be from the from the uh, Lemurian times or Atlantis. All I know is what the paleontologists of the world say. Mm -hmm. That when you go down that many miles down, the paleontologists, I don't know, they're the experts, not me. They say that's three and a half billion years old. What are your thoughts on hollow earth, the hollow earth theory then? If you can go down that far, or what about going further? I think the hollow earth is not in point of fact history. I think it's a probably a symbolic story because it doesn't doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't make sense to you? No, not at all. Hollow earth does not make any sense to me at all. It's totally ludicrous in my humble opinion. But I'm not an expert. <laughs> so what about Antarctica and, and Oh, well, no, General, Antarctica. No, that was Ad Admiral Byrd who went there with his plane and yeah, then suddenly yeah. appeared, disappeared and went into the hollow earth and saw civilizations and what, what not. I'm not sure. It's just that uh, uh, for me, the jury is still out on that question. And it's like the flat earth. Yeah, w what are your thoughts about the recent uh, flat earth uh, uh, theories uh, that are uh, uh, that the flat so popular earth does not appeal to my sense of logic and intelligence. It, it is ludicrous. However, having said that, I don't know for sure because there are some very good arguments for the flat earth that are very legitimate and need to be answered. <clears throat> and so I don't know. So I leave that up. I'll leave that till later on. So no now. hollow earth, no <clears throat> flat earth, which is the two opposites. But my feeling is no, neither one. But I'm not the world's foremost authority. So I'm just saying you're asking me my opinion. I'm saying that my opinion is neither one of them are true. But there may be something to it that we're not hearing. Well, maybe mm -hmm. it's a symbolic story telling us something. This, this hollow earth mm -hmm. appeals to me symbolically. Mm -hmm. Like there may be an inner, a world down below, an underworld, a power, and a whole world of, of people and and powers that we don't know about. Well, we could call that the Illuminati or the secret societies that control the world. They're not out here in front of you, but they're in, they're in the underworld. They're underneath of your world. And, and so that may be a symbolic story about the hollow earth. If it's actual fact, I don't know. But I don't think so. But it's how are those opinion. secret societies and the <clears throat> Illuminati, how, how are they connected to certain alien species? You've talked about this for yes. years. Yes, I am totally convinced for myself. Because of the people I have talked to and the people I've been in contact with that should know <laughs> that, uh, that I can't even mention their names or their positions in this world, but they were very high. And they have told me that, that it, it is apparent to them that the people who run our planet today, the guys who are really behind the scenes, are not, nobody is going to know who they are. You're never going to hear about them. You're never going to see them ever. You can see the presidents and all the big shots and all the oil kings and all that. But the people who are really in control of our, of our earth are not human. So it's not the 13 bloodlines behind uh, of it the could be something, Illuminati? Uh, it could be something connected to that, mm -hmm. but it's a bigger story than the 13 bloodlines. So it's, there's more? Oh yeah, there's a lot more. But they're not human, and they are superior to you in every way. In technological, and knowledge, and understanding, they have come here from a long way away. They've come here a long time ago, and they've always been here controlling our destiny as the human family. But who are they then? I don't know where, where they come they from. Where are they from? I don't know where they're from, in fact. But I suspect they're from uh, um, probably star systems 
like the Pleiades, because we hear a lot about the Pleiadians, mm -hmm. and even in the Bible, the Pleiades is spoken of as, as, as very holy to God. And, and so, the, like I said... But the, they the, are human-looking, they Yeah, they're human-looking, yeah. Are they the ones they call the Nordics? Yeah, they could be called the Nordics, but the, I think the Nordics are the extraterrestrials who probably created us. And therefore, they didn't create us, they recreated us. They changed the DNA? Changed the are, are DNA. Are we some kind of a <coughs> clone or is it like a, a genetic yes. manipulation? Again, without being, re re without being uh, you know, redundant, the scripture says, come let us, us, who's us? And the Christians will say, oh, well, that's the Blessed Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. No, that's Jewish. It's Hebrew. It's Old Testament. Don't give me all that stuff about the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Because all gods in the world are always three. All gods are in the world are, are triune gods. Brahma, Vishnu, Siva, Osiris, Isis, Horus, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. No, it's all a story. Mm. It's based on three. And then you have the three major religions, you know, uh, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. Why three? Why couldn't it be seven? No, no. And then you'll find out, no, no, you're playing with numbers now. There's something going on here, and it's encoded. So the Nordics, they came from where? I've heard that the Nordics have come from, uh, and then I've heard that they reptilians. They come from Beta Reticuli star system. Is that the what they call the Draco? Yeah, yeah, the Dracos and Dracos. Yeah, mm. I don't know, but I'm saying I've heard many times that the Dracos or the or the uh, reptilian mm -hmm. uh, they come from a, a star system called uh, Draco or um, whatever, whatever it was. I'm just telling you what I've heard. I don't know, but I have met people in my life that are not from this world. I know they're not. I can't prove it. But what they showed me and what they could do and what they knew and what they were able to do was not normal. That's not human. When you talk about the reptilians, why do we humans have a reptilian brain? I know, yeah. That's kind of interesting, isn't it? I think so. Yeah, I do too. What are your thoughts on that? I have talked with so many professional people, airline pilots, uh, high uh, government officials, law enforcement officials, military people, uh, underworld people. I've talked with a lot of people in my life. And so many times as I'm traveling around the world, Uh, giving lectures on these subjects. I meet people who are very important and they come to me and say, Jordan, I want to tell you something in private. Mm -hmm. And then I find out who they are and I'm thinking, wow, man, I'm sitting here with this guy who in the world would see me with him, I'd probably get assassinated, right? And they're telling me things that they know about the extraterrestrials who are here. Why would they tell you that? Because they have somebody to talk to that they don't have to teach. They don't have to bring me up to speed. Mm. But they also know that you could be dangerous because yeah. you're revealing these things. That's right. You're exactly. talking publicly about it. That's right. And so, so that's why would they tell you? Well, no, I'm not. I'm not doing. I'm not saying anything that could be attributed directly to some source. I'm just giving you my opinion based mm. on based on all my, my life's work. It's interesting But that if, they would tell you that, that they would tell you, maybe somebody else, that they could trust a little bit more like in a family circle or something. I have a very, very impressive scientist from NASA, from NASA. Uh, extremely brilliant guy, and he's written books. And he came to an event I was doing up in San Francisco. I was speaking in a conference, and he came to the conference, and he came over to me and said, Jordan, I want to talk with you in private. And so we went into the, into the lobby of the hotel and sat quietly in the corner. And he said, I work for NASA. Here's my identification. You know, he's a NASA scientist, physicist. And he worked on this. He's worked on that. He's worked on all these big programs. And he said, you talk about... Uh, You talk about Saturn. 
I got stuff on Saturn you don't have. <clears throat> Let me tell you some more about Saturn you don't know. And so he began to explain to me stuff about Saturn that blew my mind. And we want to know. <laughs> well, first of all, Saturn is inhabited. Somebody's there. But the surface is not uh, solid and it's gas. First of right? all, no, you don't know that. You've been told that. Oh. And so I asked him, my first question was, if you know so much about Saturn, why the rings? And it was just a conjecture. He said, I've, I've, I've talked to other people about this too in, in NASA. <clears throat> Some of them have said the rings are like a dish, like a television dish for deep space communication. So when Saturn moves around, the rings are around it, it's like a, 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 a dish. And now they can pick up communication from way out. Hundreds of thousands of light years out, they can pick up communication with the rings because it's like a television dish. <clears throat> And then when it moves around this way, sometimes it will move around where the rings are like this instead of this. And there's the planet in between, so it looks like an eye inside, an eye inside the, you know. And so Saturn is very important, very important in religion. The Jewish God today in Judaism is the planet Saturn. The Jews don't realize it, but Saturn is the god of Judaism today. Please explain that. Yes. Jewish religion today is based on the worship of Saturn. <clears throat> they probably wouldn't know that. No. It's the reason why is because who cares? I mean, nobody, nobody, reads, nobody reads anything. Nobody cares. You just do what you do because they were born into it. So if you're Catholic, you just go to Catholic church, and you, ne you never realize that as a Catholic, you're worshiping a god named Dagon, D-A-G-O-N, is the god of Catholicism. Nobody knows anything about Dagon, and nobody cares. Why? Because it's just a church. So we go to church, and we feel good, and we have all our friends there. And I said, yeah, but you're worshiping Dagon, goofball. Do you know that? Do you know who Dagon was? Who? Do you know what Dagon is? Because it's right there in front of you, if you just look at the church. I think you'll have to explain that. Yeah. You look at the church, they're worshiping a god named Dagon, spelled D-A-G-O-N. Simple. A Phoenician, Canaanite, ancient god that came out of the sea. A god that came out of the waters of the oceans. He came out of the sea and he did all kinds of miracles and strange things he knew and taught men how to live <clears throat> and how to grow food and how to do this and how to do that. And then he would go back into the ocean at night and they would see him go back into the ocean and he's gone. But that's not very <coughs> scientific. That's, that's a myth, right? It's an ancient religion, the Phoenician Canaanite religion. I didn't say it actually happened, I'm just saying that's what they believe. And you've got to remember that the ancient peoples, Sumerians and Babylonians and all those ancient peoples, uh, they were not writing for Hollywood. There was no Hollywood motion picture company. It's written in code, right? Like in the Bible. <clears throat> well, yeah, it's written in code in the Bible, yeah. yeah. But if you study it, and, and as, a, as an expert in studying it, of which I'm not an expert, but I know how to read. And so I read the experts, and they're saying, look at this scripture, see what it says here? So how is Dagon related or connected to Saturn? Oh, very interesting question. <laughs> I didn't say it was connected to Saturn, but I said the Jewish god, Yahweh, is connected to the planet Saturn. There's so many different gods that are involved in our religions. Like in, uh, like in the Hindu, they have God knows how many uh, gods. And also in the Islamic world. Islam, originally Allah was a sun god, originally. This is thousands of years before the Arabic culture of today. Uh, Allah was a sun god, and Allah was the same as Yahweh. The Hebrew god Yahweh is the Arabic god Allah, Allah Yahweh. It's the same God. And both Allah or Yahweh, Jewish or Islamic, 
Originally, Allah and Yahweh were sun gods. But then something happened in the ancient history to change that so that Yahweh or Yahweh and Allah are now moon gods. And Moses was the leader of a moon cult. Moses was a leader of a lunar worshiping cult. And so Yahweh was the moon. Well, it was actually the sun. Yeah, but now at Moses' time, the Yahweh is now the moon god. And so the moon god in Arabic was, uh, was Allah. So Allah is a moon god. And so today, the Jews have got the sun worship with Yahweh, and they also got the uh, moon worship with Moses. Moses was a lunar, leader of a lunar cult, of a moon god. But Moses is a fictional character. Yeah, right? Moses is a fictional character. And so, and so was Jesus a fictional character. So was all of these, uh, I, I, you know, King Solomon. There was no King Solomon. But it's like a subliminal message. Yeah, there's a whole there. method of distributing religious thinking and concepts and ideas. But I believe that there's somebody very intelligent, not from here, who is manipulating all of this. <clears throat> to entertain us, giving us gods and philosophies and ancient religions and never realizing in your mind for a moment all of these stories are coming from somewhere and somebody is leading us. How is that connected to Saturn? Saturn is a very important planet in all the ancient religions of the world. All the ancient religions. You say it's a transmitter because of the rings you said. Well, I'm just saying that as an idea that I've heard expressed. But the bottom line is Saturn is very important in all, and the Hindus will tell you Saturn is extremely important. The, 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 the Catholics, uh, Buddhists, uh, all the ancient religions of the world Saturn is very important. So is that the reason why, because Saturn looks like an eye with the rings around, is that why they have the all-seeing eye? That's, that's, that's what some of the best physicists and scientists and mythologists who work together have been saying for a long time. There's companies out there that have been, the, the, uh, companies of scientists, philosophers, mythologists, some of the great minds of the world uh, are saying, that's what they're saying. And I was a member of that organization. There's one organization in particular that's very famous for saying that. It's up in Portland, Oregon. And at one time I was affiliated with that. And I even hosted their conferences um, back in 1995 where we were talking about, or they were talking about, I was just a host of the conference, but they were talking about where are all of these stories about the gods and, and who created us and the end of the world and all these things come from. And they went into the science behind it and all the philosophies behind it and, and the different religions and, what, and where they got those ideas. And I was sitting there for four days listening to all the uh, incredible scientists and physicists and. And, and mythologists talking about the world of ancient religions and what really was there. So the all-seeing eye is the eye of God? No, that was the eye of God in Egypt. In Egypt it was called the eye of God. Why? Because you are, it, when, when God's son, and we call Jesus God's son, you know, no it's S-U-N, not S-O-N, and God's son, well he's the light of the world. Well of course the son is the light of the world. Well, yeah, but he's our risen savior. I, yeah, I know. Every 5.30 in the morning, it always rises. So he's the, he's the, he's the risen savior. And the, and the sun god in Egypt was called Ra? Ra. Uh, one name was Ra. Uh, another one was Aton, or the Aten. And that's a different religion that was in, uh, in, in Egypt. If they called the sun god Aten, or Aton, Mm -hmm. Look it up in a dictionary, A-T-O-M was the Aton, was the sun god in Egypt. <clears throat> so now the Hebrews, uh, the Jews have Yahweh. And, but the, the Jews will tell you that God's name is so important that you should not use his name. You should not use his name at all. So you use a, a, a substitute and they write it with four letters. They write the four letters and the four letters uh, represent the most holy of all gods in the whole world but it's, in, it's, it's just four letters. 
And so the Jews called that the Tetragrammaton. Are you aware of that? No. Yeah, well, Tetragrammaton is the name of God in its most holiest form, uh, but you cannot use his name, his, his real name. So the name of God is Aton, because Tetragrammaton is Tetra, which means four, mm -hmm. Gramma, which means a letter, like you're writing mm -hmm. uh, A, B, C, those are letters. So Tetra is four, Gramma is a letter, A-T-O-N, Tetragramma Aton. But the Jews will tell you today, ask any Jewish rabbi or any Jews, what's the name of, name of God? And they said, no, we can't use that, can't use his name. Well, what do you call him then? We call him Tetragrammaton. Tetragrammaton, A-T-O-N. Mm -hmm. And then everywhere around the world and every synagogue you will ever go into in any country of the world, you will always see God's name inside a sun. Mm -hmm. Always. Always. But that was L, right? E-L. No, no, that's different. That's different. Again, El was the name of God, but Tetragrammaton is a particular God. So when we hear that Jews were the first monotheistic religion, monotheistic means a worshiper of one God. But you're mistaken. The Jews were not the first monotheistic religion. That was in Egypt. But as the rabbi explained to me, the, the Jews were not monotheistic, they were heno, spell H-E-N-O, henotheistic. Henotheistic means choosing one God from a group. Of several. Of several. But you chose one. So if you've got 15 gods standing here, they're all equal. And you pick one. I'm picking you to be my God. And if you accept, okay, then I am now picking you and I'm agreeing and I'll be your God and you'll be my people. So therefore we can say that I as a Jew am now a worshiper of one God. Not the one God of the whole universe. No, I, I have 15 of them and I picked him. So I'm the worshiper of one God. Yeah, that God. And that's why in the, in the, in the Bible and the Ten Commandments, God says in the Ten Commandments right off the, right off the start, he says, I am the Lord your God, and I will not have strange gods before me. He didn't say I'm the almighty God. No, I am the Lord your God. You picked me, and I agreed. So we got a contract here. The same thing a young man would say to a girl that he's going steady with. Yeah, there are other young men out there even better than me, but I'm, I'm committed to you, and you're committed to me. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there are a lot of other young men out there, but I better not see you with one of them. I don't want to have any other man in your life but me. Mm -hmm. So we've made a deal here. Mm -hmm. I picked you and you agreed to pick me. Mm -hmm. And so when you say Jews are God's chosen people, no, the, they picked one God. So they're the worshiper of one God. Yeah, but there's 14 others you didn't, you didn't mention. So right. that's that way to understand that. So in what way is Saturn connected to that religion in, in well, Judaism? Well, Saturn, Saturn was connected because Saturn was referred to as the inhibitor. Uh, Saturn, in all the ancient sciences of the world, everybody knows that Saturn was called the inhibitor, the, the, the stable one. Why? Because it's always sitting right there. And it's the only, as we can't see any planets out past Saturn. But with your naked eye, at least you can see Saturn. It's a little star, but if you look at it, it's Saturn. And so Saturn was called the inhibitor, which means anything <clears throat> that, can in, in, uh, that can hold you back and teach you a lesson. So therefore, mafia, police department, government, the military, the marines, they're called Saturnalian uh, societies. They're Saturnian. Why? Because they can hold you back. They can put you in prison. They can teach you a lesson. So any organization that is powerful enough to teach you a lesson and hold you back, we call it Saturnian. Talk to anybody who knows these words. Saturnian means severe holding you back and teaching you a lesson. So therefore, the Jews will worship Saturn on Saturn's day. They go to Temp L, and L is Saturn. So L is Saturn in the ancient world 
<clears throat> well, it says in the beginning, El uh, said, come let us, us, who's us? And so therefore, what I'm saying is that Saturn is the inhibitor who holds you back. So the ancient Jews or the ancient people said, if he's going to hold us back, then we're going to, and incidentally, the, uh, the planet Saturn in the ancient Phoenician language, in the ancient Phoenician language, the planet Saturn was referred to as Shabbat. S-H-A-B-B-A-T-H. Shabbat was Saturn. And so if you're going to worship Saturn, and he's Shabbat, then you do it on a day you call Sabbath. Sabbath is Shabbat. Shabbat, Shabbat is the planet Saturn. So the Jews worship Shabbat on the Sabbath. And that's why they go to uh, the, the synagogue and have their holy day on Saturn's day or Saturday, right? And they always have their holy days after sundown, after six o'clock. They have their holy days, and always the holy days after six. Why? Because that's when their day starts. Their day starts after six o'clock. So unlike Christians, we at, at, at 12, uh, 5 o'clock in the morning, we greet the sun. No, no, they're worshipers of the moon. And so from Egypt, looking eastward, from Egypt, looking east, there's a whole series of high mountains in the Sinai. And every night, the moon comes up in the east from the mountains. So they call him, the Arabs call him the old man of the mountain who lives in the mountain. Why do we say that? Well, obviously, every night it comes up from the mountain. But it comes up after the sun's gone down. It comes up at 6 o'clock. So if we're going to worship the old man of the mountain or the moon, we do it at 6 o'clock in the evening. Because now he's going to be in charge of the universe all night long. And so that's when our day begins because we're worshiper of the moon. So it's a moon. Even the Jews will tell you they have a lunar calendar. And so they, they, they trace their day from many moons. Well, but so is the Native Americans. They trace their, they're called tribes. So, so we Saturn tribes. is very, it's also connected to the moon, definitely. And also, the, several researchers say that Saturn and then the name Satan is related. Now, I got news for you. You hear a lot of talk about Lucifer. Yes. Yeah, Lucifer this and Lucifer the devil and Lucifer. Well, in point of fact, if you do something really interesting, go to a library and read a book. Go to a, a library and read reference books on words and terms. Most people don't have time to do that. If you do that and you do the study of the word Lucifer, you will find out Lucifer is Jesus. Jesus is Lucifer. The Bible says that. So a word that is that that means the opposite, and people worship it, like what Satan, Sat uh, Saturn. Satan. Satan is a word in Hebrew meaning an opposer in court. So if you're going to in court and you're a Jew and you're going into court with another Jew, and so in the, in the Jewish religion, you're going into court against your brother against another Jew. That's very serious. Uh, you take a Gentile to court, maybe, but now you're going into court to fight another fellow Jew. So that's a defense lawyer? No, it just means two Jews fighting in court. Really? And Is that so, what it means? Yeah, and so basically that's where it comes from. And so the word for an opposer in court, when you are opposing a, your brother in a court, you're enemies now. You're fighting each other in court. So you're an enemy. Well, the word for an enemy that you're opposing in court is called a satan, S-A hyphen T-A-N, a satan. A satan is an opposer who's opposing you in front of the judge. The judge is God. He's opposing you. He's saying you lied and you did something, and he's telling God. He's telling the judge. The judges all wear black robes because black robes were assigned to Saturn, Saturn's god, Saturn's a priest. Priests of Saturn always wore black robes. So a black robe represents someone who is officially representing Saturn, 
the god Saturn who's the inhibitor. And he is the inhibitor as the judge. He can throw you into so jail. So he is connected. Oh yeah, it's very, very connected. Satan and Saturn. Yeah, Satan and Saturn. But I'm saying that Saturn is a god of the Jews today. And they worship him on Saturn's day. And his name in the Phoenician language is Shabbat. And so they have today something called Sabbath. Mm -hmm. So in the Ten Commandments, remember to keep holy the Sabbath. Sabbath is a worship of planet Saturn. Why would you need to keep that holy? You need to go back in school and learn your own religion. You need to understand what these words mean. I mean, don't tell me I need to keep the Sabbath holy. Why? But Why they certainly would not believe or think or want to well, embrace saying, the idea that they, that's actually me, what they, they are serving or what they are be believing no, of in. Of course no, they don't know that they're serving Saturn. They don't know. No. But, but one of the most important symbols in Judaism is the six-pointed star, the, six, the, right? the, the star of Saturn, the star of David. The star of David is six-pointed, so it's a hex. The ancient peoples in the ancient world used to draw a circle on the ground and then draw a triangle in it. And then they would draw in another triangle uh, opposing it. So that's the star of David inside a circle. Then hexagram. Would, huh? It's a hexagram. Then you step inside of it and cast an evil, evil spell on you. And so that's where we get the word, they're casting the hex on you. They get the hex put on you. Because they're standing inside the hex and they're putting the hex on you. And, and so hex means which? Hex means a six-pointed star. Mm. And so today the Jews walk around proudly to show they got the hex put on them. Right? Because it is a six-pointed star, and the, and the encyclopedia says a six-pointed anything is a hex. But in Satanism, they use the five-pointed star. Now, that's different. That's Lucifer. That's the Luciferian star. But Lucifer is Jesus in the Bible. Jesus even says it in himself. He says in Revelation 16, the last, the 22, 16, the very last book of the Bible is Revelation. And the very last chapter in Revelation is the 22nd chapter. So go to the very last chapter, the very last book, and look up Revelation 22, 16. And Jesus said, I, Jesus, I am the offspring of David, and I am Lucifer. That's what it says. And so I'm saying, I didn't write the Bible. I'm not writing it. I'm just telling you what it says. If you just go do some homework and go read it yourself and explain it to me then. But that's what he said. I am Lucifer. And so what... So the Christians are also worshipping the opposite than what they believe and what they exactly think right. they're doing. They're worshipping Lucifer. The same that you said the, the, that the Jews are doing. Yeah, exactly. And the Muslims too. The so whole world is... The is, whole world is worshipping what? Something satanic? Yeah, that's what I think. And I think that when I say satanic, <laughs> I think the whole world and all the worship is going on throughout the world is being, is being led. We are all humans and we're being led into this by higher powers in the universe. Higher Why would they want us to uh, worship something that is sinister and dark instead of something good and light which people think they're worshiping? Yeah. Well, when you, when you meet them, uh, them, whoever they are, ask them that. That's a good question. I, I, I don't run into them often. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I actually had an incredible experience at Area 51. And How which could it, you go near it? It's very, it's totally prohibited. No, no, to no. It, it, I call it Area 51. It's a little town outside of the base called Rachel. Mm. Rachel is a little Mickey Mouse little right. establishment out there yeah. in the middle of nowhere. Is it near the Alien Center? Yeah, yeah. It's near S, S4 and all of that's just, it's just like, like a mountain range. It's only about a mile out of some mountains. And over those mountains is Area 51 and right. S4. So you can sit here in a restaurant at night and have a beer and have dinner, and you're only in a, a, a mile from Area 51. So anything coming in or going out at nighttime, you're going to see. Mm -hmm. And that's why people go there to, uh, to Rachel and sit out at night and watch all kinds of strange things. So is going. it true what they say? Oh, that, yeah. That, that is going on inside of Area 51? No and doubt also the underground I, levels? No doubts in my mind whatsoever because I've seen things with my own eyes there that will challenge your understanding of life on the earth. I've seen it. 
I was there with other people. I'll give you their names. We saw things there that you would not believe. What did you see? We saw seven. It's a big story. I could go back and it's a big story. Just briefly. Briefly, we saw seven beautiful full moon size UFOs uh, <clears throat> 20 miles north of Rachel. We were 20 miles north of Rachel mm -hmm. in an area called Railroad Junction. <clears throat> and we were out there about 2 o'clock in the morning. Uh, a lady friend of mine and a friend of mine who owns a bookstore in San Diego. Uh, and all three of us went out there. And we saw, uh, when we got out of the car, it was totally, totally black, but it was all overcast. You couldn't see anything. All of a sudden, the clouds opened up a little bit, and two beautiful, gorgeous, glowing, bluish-white saucer shape came in and stopped over the top of us. They were gorgeous. They were uh, uh, emanating light on the clouds above them. They were reflecting their light on the clouds. <clears throat> Five more came in behind them, and there were seven of them sitting right over our head. All seven were beautiful, gorgeous, and scary, frightening to me. Mm. My two friends thought they were beautiful and were delighted to see them. I was frightened, and it scared me, because I know something they don't know, mm. and I know this is not human. And whatever but it could is, it be military <coughs> and something that the military technology... I know a lot of people think that it could be just us military. But I'm telling you, what we saw them do and what we saw later, it wasn't military. It was not of this world. Because one of the aliens came in our bedroom when we went back to Area 51. In your bedroom? Yes, in our bedroom. It came into the motel where we were staying that night. After we saw the seven, we went back to our motel in Rachel, and we were there in the bedroom, and there were two beds, there were two bedrooms, and my, my friend who's a publisher in San Diego, he stayed in the one bedroom, and my lady friend of mine, uh, uh, she's a radio talk show host in Hawaii, she and I stayed in this one room. Wow, you always want to have invited guests in your bedroom, don't you? No, I don't want visitors from another world in my bedroom. My <laughs> friends, that's okay, but no. That's it. And so we laid in bed talking about what we saw tonight, those seven beautiful disc-shaped things out there in the desert. And what, what we saw them do, what we saw them do right. was not human. Not human, not military, no thank you. Not human at all. They did things that humans can't do. And so, and I know, I was born and raised in a Navy town in Florida. One of the largest naval air stations in the world is in Pensacola, Florida. The single largest naval air station in the whole world mm -hmm. is in my hometown. What came into your bedroom after you had seen Some those lights? Some kind of an alien. In the middle of the night, I, uh, we were talking that night before we went to sleep. We were talking about what did we see tonight? Because what they were doing out there in the desert, we humans can't do. We don't have that kind of right. uh, uh, technology. Uh, for instance, what, what they would do is there were seven of them. They're big. They were like full moon size, yeah. seven. Yeah. And they're glowing bluish white light. Yeah. And, 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 and you said that. Yeah. yeah. But then they would come together instantly. And Merge. Just a, and a, quicker than a blink of an eye, they would come together all seven without touching each other. Mm -hmm. And then less than a blink of an eye, they would blow out, and now there's a big circle of seven. Then instantly they would all change size in a blink of an eye. They were all different places. And one blink of an eye, boom, they were all changed. And then we were standing looking at that thing, going, and they would all change again. In a blink of an eye, from out there to out there, in a blink of an eye, they all change. All seven of them mm -hmm. change. And then they come together in a circle and blew, blew out in a circle. And we don't have that kind of technology to Except do that. Except maybe if it's holographic. Well, that's always possible. That's possible. But how do you explain the alien that came in our bedroom? Yeah, I want to know about that yeah, alien. I'll bet Please you tell don't. me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You need to enter, you need to talk. What kind of alien was that? We now we are we are so excited. We need to know. Yeah. Well, 
the alien that came in our bedroom that night obviously knew it was one from out there that we saw. And when we what came back, what did it look like? I'm going to tell you. It didn't come into our bedroom where, where Ivy and I were. I fell asleep. We finally all went to sleep. Then the next morning, I got up, and, and Paul and Ivy had already gone over to the restaurant to have breakfast. And so I go over there, and there's a big bunch of people at the table, a bunch of people uh, at the table, and Paul and Ivy are telling them, talking to them. So I think they're telling them about the seven UFOs we saw last night. So I sit down at the table, and then I find out, no, they're not talking about the seven UFOs. They're talking about the alien that came in our room last night. And he came in Paul's room, and he woke him up. And, and Paul Tice, can, you, know, you can talk to him. He's the one that saw it. And Ivy said she saw a little bit of it from the bed, our bedroom, because it's right next door, the other bedroom, and both doors were open. And so she saw some of the action going on in there, but the alien was visiting Paul, not me. I slept through it. <clears throat> I so slept. did he say what it looked like? Yeah, oh yeah, he explains exactly what it looked what like. What did it, it look like? He said that when he said he was sound asleep, and all of a sudden he woke up, involuntarily woke up, and was totally, totally awake. Instantly, it was totally awake. And he said, and just above him was a little night light, a little, a little light in the ceiling. But it hadn't worked. It wasn't on. It never has worked. And he said, but he looked up at the light, and there was a face, an alien's face, and it was greenish. And it was like a, a hologram, like a hologram. You could see through the face, too. You could see the lamp above it. Oh. But this green face was looking at him, and he said, all of a sudden, as he saw it, he looked at it, and it's looking at him, this hologram face. The room started circulating. He said, the room started circulating around me in my mind. And he said, I'm seeing the door going this way, then I'm seeing the, the, the window going this way, then I see the door coming back around. And so I'm seeing the room is circulating while I'm looking at this alien face. Mm -hmm. Then it slides across the ceiling, hits the wall, and comes down. And then he said, and I got up, sitting in bed, and now it's even with me. And we're talking to each other. And so I would, I would prefer you talk to, to uh, Paul. I'll put you in touch with him. He hadn't been smoking anything funny, had he? Paul Tice, everybody who knows Paul, he's a very businessman. He's, he's a publisher. But he's had a lot of strange experiences in his life with aliens and extraterrestrials. We were just touching upon the, this subject on, on the reptilians. Is that something you can go into? That would, it would be very interesting if you can talk a little bit because a lot of people are talking about how the uh, reptilian race or races are involved in worldly matters, uh, things well, They Earth. are what I think is who is running the world. I think we're being, uh, the whole human race is being misled by alien life forms who have come here from another place who are smarter than we are, technologically superior, just way down the, lo way down the road smarter than you'll ever be. And they know how to run civilizations, and they know how to start religions and governments. They call the shots because they have powers we don't have, and they can make things happen. Reptilians. Well, the reptilians are wherever they may be. Maybe Pleiadians. I don't know who they are. In point of fact, I haven't gone to their house yet. But can you mention a couple of different races that have that are very important? Well, to yeah, this whole like the Dogon. UFO phenomenon. Yeah, like Dogons. The it's spelled D O G O N. Dogon, not Dagon. Dagon is a oh, Catholic. Kind of similar. Well, yeah. Dagon is D-A-G-O-N, mm -hmm. which is the god of the Catholic Church. But there is a group of, there's a black, uh, in Somalia, in Africa, there's a black tribe of, of natives there. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that Indian tribe is called, the black tribe is called uh, Dogons, D-O-G-O-N-S, Dogons. And go back and read in the, in, in, on the web, so go look up Dogons mm -hmm. and read about uh, some really very impressive scientists and people, writers and researchers. What do they look like? It's just a bunch of black tribesmen, people live in a tribe in, in Somalia, but they 
are now blowing uh, people's minds of what these, these, what these tribal people can do. They, they know everything about the universe. They tell you everything about the universe, how, how, how heavy the sun is, how heavy the earth is, all the different planets and how they, how they got here. And they are telling you all kinds of things that scientists today are just now beginning to find out they're right. And they know all about the stars, the star systems, and how far it is from one place to another, and how to do this, how to do that, how to do space travel. And so, and so now scientists have finally heard about them, the Dogons, D-O-G-O-N-S. Oh. And so they've gone over there and talked to them. Mm -hmm. And they say, how do you know all of these things that we didn't even know? NASA is learning from you. All the things you're telling us are fascinating and they're true. How do you know this? You're just a black tribe in, in the mountains of, of Mali, and we are the, the great scientists in America, and you're telling us things we've never heard. So though, those that tribe in Mali yeah. is is they're called the Dogons, is, and they a, know is, uh, they know all kinds of things about the universe and us as humans that nobody knows. So they ask them, these scientists and, and writers and people who go with it to visit. How do you know these things? Because you're right. Well, we didn't even know it. How do you know it? And they said, they come and tell us. Ever so many years, the aliens come from out there and they meet us, they come to our place, they come to our, 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 our community, and they tell us in our own language, in our language, they tell us about the universe, about what they're going to do, about what's going to happen on the earth and when it's going to happen and who's going to do this and who's going to do that and what's going to happen to the whole world. And they tell us all these things. So when they leave, we just tell everybody else, and nobody knows what we're talking about until you find out we were right. Well, how did you know? It's simple. They told us. That's mm -hmm. all we know. They come here and they tell us. They come down and they're they're they're. So saucer. is that a good race that huh? tell? Is that a good alien race that are telling the Dogons these things? I don't know. Read read uh, Robert Temple. Templeton's book. He's the one that made it famous. He's from, I think, France. And a French writer and author and lecturer and a scientist. And he went there and stayed with the Dogons and listened to them and, and, and learned. And he's written a book called The Dogons. Uh, and, and I think it's like two or three books now where he explains who they are and what they know and how they know it. And today all over the world, top scientists and top governments of the world want to know what else are the Dogons telling you? Because everything they've said so far, we had no idea in the world about, and they were right. And That's so they say that there's aliens coming from out there. Well, somebody's telling them. Hmm. And so you better find out who these people, these Dogons, really are. Hmm. What are your thoughts on the theory of shape-shifting? I think that is extremely possible. Yes, I, I have no problem with that at all. I think that's very possible because the technology, we know how it works. I mean, I've had, I've had all kinds of people in government and military telling me about the technology. Here's how it works. Because you're an energy form. You are an energy form. We are holographic. Not really solid? No, well, of course we're not solid because they tell you that we're 76% water. And, uh, and so we're solid, yes, but uh, there's more to the science than meets the eye. And I've just listened to the scientists. I'm not a, an authority in that field. But I'm listening to the scientists who are telling us that we are not who you think we are. We're capable of a lot more than what we're doing. And that some of us are not even human. We look human. Well, uh, I would say when I hear that from somebody that we have uh, aliens who are leading us. In government. Government, but religious leaders, who knows what the Pope really is. What is the Pope really? I'm saying they could be aliens from another world that look like human. They look like human. But shapeshift. But they have shifted into a shape where you can see them as a man. So they could shift back again to their original yeah. form. Yeah, absolutely. What would the original form well, be? Well, I don't know, but I'm just saying, you mm -hmm. just asked the, the generic question, uh, what do you think about shape shifting? And I said, I'm totally convinced it's, 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 it's true. 
And it's plausible. It makes sense to me. Now, how do you explain it? I can't explain it. I don't know. But the concept I understand because I've talked to so many intelligent people about it. Military people, scientists, philosophers. Teachers. Many people say we are holographic. And in that way, energetically, you could, you could change the form. It's like an atom, which is not solid. I know. And even yeah. the, this table and everything is made of atoms. And if you go closely, then... Nothing is solid. I've heard of people who can walk through walls. Uh, I don't know. I can't do it. But I've heard of people, scientists who are people, very legitimately important people in, in government have told me, we've seen him walk through a wall. I don't know. I wasn't there. But this guy has got credentials, and he's, he's got all the credentials of a scientist, and he said he saw somebody walk through a wall. And I know there's a lot of stuff going on in this world that you would not believe unless you saw it yourself. And then if you see it yourself, I mean really something spectacular, like a person walking through a wall or something. If you saw it yourself, and you talk with that person who just walked through the wall, Or if you saw somebody shapeshift. Well, of course. But if you saw that yourself, then I would say, well, how do you prove that? You would say to you me, I, I don't need to prove it. I was there. I don't care if you believe me or not. I'm just, I'm just honoring you by being here to talk to you and tell you. If you don't believe me, I don't care. I know what I saw. How about mind control? Mind control is overwhelmingly obvious. It's everywhere. All kinds of mind control, not just the old Mickey Mouse back in the 1950s with the... Uh, with the, uh, the MK Ultra? Yeah, the MK Ultra, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about something far, far more serious. All kinds of electro electrical interference with the human brain. Because your mind, your brain is like a computer. And your spine is carrying electrical force field to move your body. But our scientists have been talking ever since Nikolai Tesla. Tesla talked about the human body being a computer and an electrical force field. And so if you're smart like Tesla, I'm not, but if you're smart like him, uh, you might figure out a way to manipulate your electrical force field. Well, we now know they can do that. We now know that they can see you at night. We have cameras that can see you at night. If you're out in the jungle, they can see you moving. Night vision? Night vision is one thing, but there are high, highly technical military uh, instruments that can see a human uh, in, in a dark forest, totally black, but they can see the human. And they can see him walking wide because your body is giving off an electrical field. And this camera is designed to pick up that electrical field. So in the military, if you're out at night, totally dark at night, and you're moving around, but you can see other humans. They don't know that you're seeing them, but you can see them, how many there are. And can they also look through walls? Uh, absolutely, I think so. Mm -hmm. You have to understand that your particular religion is based on where you were born. If you were born in Africa, then you would have a certain concept and idea about God and the theology and religion. Unless, of course, you were born in, in, in uh, the Yukon. And now as an as a, uh, Eskimo, you have your idea about God and theology and, and who runs the universe. Unless, of course, you were born in Russia. Now you would have the Russian Orthodox idea about God, etc., etc. Unless, of course, you happen to be born in China. So the idea, I'm, 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 the point I'm making, is that whatever it is you believe is only because of where you happen to have been born. It doesn't mean you know the whole universe and know anything. It just means that's what you believe, because the people you hung around with you were... Indoctrination, more so than just brainwash or mind control. I had a man, Compartmentalization. I had a man on the national level in America at the very top in America, one of the top people in this country uh, that you would not even suspect that I know. And he told me, he said, Jordan, I'm a Jew. I was born a Jew. And so that's who I am. I'm a Jew. But I don't know uh, if, if the religion is right. I don't know. That's not what I do. I do something else. I'm in government. But I was born a Jew. 
And so I have a feeling, an affection for God as, as a Jew. But that doesn't mean I know anything. I'm not sure of anything. I'm sure when I go and do my job in government, I'm sure I know what I'm doing. But when we talk about theology and religion, he said to me, I would much prefer listening to you because that's obviously what you've been you know, evolving in your life all your life is theology and religion. Mm -hmm. So I would much rather listen to you. And I said, well, thank you. Uh, and, and I said, but <clears throat> I know a lot about government and the laws of government. But if we're going to talk about government and, and a leader circle, I'd rather you do the talking, not me, because that's your field. And, and you know, theology, religion is my field, and I respect your field. So he said to me, well, good, now we got a good relationship. You stay out of my business, I'll stay out of your business. He said, but if I want to know something about God, I would call you and talk with you. If you need to know something about government, you know, call me. I don't know. And did he know something about mind control? Oh, yeah. yeah. And what, what did he say? Well, his position in government was so high up that I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not about to tell you who he was. No. But Pardon? he was well aware of how the technology works to control. And, and here's one thing you need to know about mind control is that when we talk about magic, uh, magic to most people is the magician doing his magical stuff with the cards and all that. That's not magic. That's not, in fact, magic. That's sleight of hand. That's being crafty and clever. Right. But that's not magic. Magic as a real, uh, a real thing is very, very powerful otherworldly demonism, devil worship kind of thing. Satanism. Yeah. The occult. Yeah, the occult. It's dealing with powers from the universe that you don't have, but you make a deal with them, and they will let you, they will do for you what you need done, and then you do for them what they need done. Is that what some people refer to as the archons? Yeah, and, and a lot of motion picture and entertainment people will tell you they've made a deal with the devil. And lots and lots and lots of important people have said that publicly. We made a deal Because with the devil. Because they took part in satanic rituals. Yes, taking part. In, uh, I, I could tell you things which are going on in Hollywood right now. But let me tell you something. Um, understand this. In Europe, uh, before the Roman Empire existed, before Rome, Europe was already dominated by a culture of people. And then Rome came along and overtook it. But there was already a very powerful culture of people in North, East, West, and Southern Europe. And this is where we get our word news, North, East, West, and South, you know, N-E-W-S. And so anything that happens in the North, East, West, or South is news. No, it's the, the letters make the word news. But uh, there was already a highly developed culture of people living in Europe. And they were called Druids. And today, there's still a very powerful uh, culture in Europe and America. America is pure, almost pure uh, Druid. Today, America is, is a Druid company, country. Well, so is Europe. Europe is very Druidic. And the ancient symbols and the words and terms, etc., uh, that they use in Europe, they don't realize those are Druid words and terms. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the most important symbols that the ancient Druids in Europe used Uh, and they were the, the Druids were always the lawyers, the doctors, the priests, the priests. Uh, anything that was important to be, it was a Druid. Druids were very powerful and very intelligent people. But the most important symbol that the Druids had for their magical, to show that they were a magical priest, was a, was a magic wand, like Merlin the Magician from England, Merlin the Magician with a magic wand. Orchestra leaders and conductors around the world use a magic wand, so you play to their music, not yours. I'll tell you when to do this and when to do that. And so the magic wands were always a symbol of druidic magic, real magic. But magic wands were always made out of the wood of a holly tree. It's made out of holly wood. Get it? And so today, 
we are we hum, we are Americans are orchestrating magic around the world in Hollywood because it's a druid symbol. And if you bother to go to the encyclopedias or go on the web and look and put into the web uh, 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 pictures, just pictures, just uh, images, not, 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 the, not the regular web, but just on images, and type in Jesus with magic wand, you will see all over Europe and around the world the Old Testament and New Testament people, the, the 12 apostles, Jesus, Abraham, all the uh, names in the, in the Bible are all doing their, their miracles with a magic wand. There's all kinds of pictures of Jesus with a magic wand raising the dead and feeding the poor. And the magic wands are made out of the wood of a holly tree. It's made out of Hollywood. And so what I'm saying to you is that Hollywood is a very legitimately de jure and real magical system. And because of that, you have to do rituals, blood rituals, human sacrifice. There's a very powerful, real, legitimate, not of this world magic. And those people who are running Hollywood are connected to things you don't know anything about. And they, they have the power now to manipulate the world with motion pictures and television. Who's orchestrating that? In Hollywood. All of that is being orchestrated out of Hollywood, but it's not because these people are so clever and, and resourceful and talented. No, they are connected to a power that is not of this world. They're connected to something going on that you would understand as demonism or devil worship or spirit worship. So uh, actors and singers take part in that? Oh, of course they do. Absolutely. Did you see the movie? Uh, that uh, uh, eyes wide shut. Yes. Yeah. Stanley Kubrick. Yeah, Stanley Kubrick. Stanley Kubrick died shortly after that movie was made. That's What do you way. know about eyes wide shut and Stanley Kubrick? Well, I just know that first of all, that that big party that was a a, a satanic mass of some sort, so some sort of like a satanic thing. I'm not talking about. Uh, my influence on you or my influence because I'm a wealthy man and I'm influencing you. No. And what's Hollywood is an influence you don't even know is happening. It's not of this world. It causes people to commit suicide. It can cause you to kill someone. Some kind of an other world connection to the human mind and to the human world that we live in is controlling you. If you're in, involved in Hollywood and you're involved in the motion picture business or in international banking or in the oil industry, the guys at the top who cause things to happen, they're all being manipulated by spirit forces. The Illuminati are humans that are being manipulated by spirit forces. We all, at the lowest level all the way up to the Illuminati guys at the top, we're all human. And yet, some of us have magnificent powers to do things. We come into the world as a Rockefeller and we're changing society. But you don't, what you don't know is that the human race is being manipulated by a higher power that you can't see. But can, but can we put a name to that higher power? Well, I, I call it the spirit world. Is that the Archons? Yeah, the archons. Yeah. And the Muslims call them the jinn. Yeah, that's exactly right, the jinns. And the, and the Christians call them demons and devils. The Jews call them uh, a different name. Everybody so they knows. are spirit beings. Yes, they are spirit beings. And they're not high, physical. Not physical. They're spirit beings. They can work through reptilians. And some reptilians and other alien species are physical and some are non-physical, That's right? exactly right. But, but you need to understand that there is all over the earth a domination of the human family, of humans, by extraterrestrial or other world entities that you can't see. All the world of religion believes that there are spirits out there. God is out there and the angels are out there. That's who actually, in point of fact, runs Hollywood, are those spiritual entities. They are using Hollywood to manipulate us, to manipulate the human race. 
We put out movies that cause the riots. We put out movies that promote the one group against the other so group. That is, that is the mind control. The that, collective mind control. Yeah, exactly. But it's very, very real, very, very powerful, and really scary. Because if you hear that, that they're sacrificing a child tonight, and you know, there, there's human sacrifice in California, in Los Angeles. There's human sacrifice. Have I you got, heard that that is actually real? Oh, God, yeah, of course. There's human sacrifice that goes on continually in Hollywood. It's human sacrifice, children are being sacrificed. There's Why? Sex, it's simple, it's very simple, because if they are going to help you, they can help you. The spirits uh, have powers and know knowledge and uh, powers and technology you don't know anything about. And they can do things that would just scare you. And you think it's just God couldn't do this. Hmm. No, it's not God. It's an extraterrestrial and he's been around 400 million years and you haven't. So he knows a lot more about the universe and magic than you do. And so he can come here and look like God to you. I mean, and so if he gives me, if I make a deal with him, I'll give him my body and my life and my soul. If you will give to me what I want, I want to be able to do what you do. I want to dazzle people with. But why would you need to sacrifice another human or a child to to, to gain that knowledge? That's because it's always been that way in religion. Any time you go to a god in any religion and ask for something that he would give you, he wants something back. And so it's always been that way. Why do all the races of the world have gods that they sacrifice to? With that, he's also now, he's, it's like the mafia. It's like underworld organization. You need something bad. You need a million dollars bad because your, your, your family is going to die. And you go to some big shot in the mob world. And he says, okay, how much you need? Oh, I need 500,000 bad. So he said, okay, here's, here's the 500,000, okay? I give it to you, you want it there, I give it to you. Now you owe me, you owe me. And when I call you for whatever I call you, you better be here. Because you came to me, I didn't come to you, you came to me and asked for something, I gave it to you. Now you owe me. And you, know, you take that lightly, you better think about it. Because you better you say no to the thirty-five thousand. You don't ever say no to the guy who's the boss. But a lot of actors can become huge stars without being involved in oh, all of, of that. Of course, of course, yeah. But I don't think I think that even the stars who are not actually taking part in these rituals are they are aware. They are aware that when they're told something, you better listen. You know, I don't think that Robert De Niro's are just carefree and do whatever they want, no. But now there just came out a lot of um, revelations about Harvey Weinstein. Yeah, that doesn't, that didn't faze me at all. It was almost silly. I, you know, you think that's bad? I can tell you some stories that will turn your hair well, Why do you think that became such a world phenomenon? I think somebody, I think somebody is trying to unravel that demonic pit back there and do something about cleaning it up or do something about getting rid of it. Somebody on this earth is very powerful and I think they are tired of all the crap that's going on in Hollywood with the sex and drugs and rituals. But it's women being uh, yeah, well, abused yeah, but, but by But you him. know as well as I do that that's, that's, uh, that's not even half the story. So is it a feminist agenda? It's a sexual agenda. It has to do with sex as a, as a, for, for the sake of sex itself. What sex actually is. And so when you understand sex, what it actually is, is there's a magical, electrical and magical connection to sex. Yeah, and so that's what the ejaculation of the man feels, is this overwhelming uh, sense of spirituality. Well, that's what we're talking about, this overwhelming uh, presence of spirituality within the human mind and the human body, the male energy, because it's impregnating the female. And so therefore in any marriage <clears throat> or any sexual act, it's the man 
And so the male is manufacturing. Mm -hmm. And the woman is receiving from the man, well, he's manufacturing, mm -hmm. and she is in labor, producing the product. So, so are they trying labor. to separate the sexes in a mind control kind of way? Yeah, yeah. Why? Because they, because of the well, depopulation because, plan or? Well, because it can be used to wipe out your memory of who you are, wipe out your memory of what, uh, who you are, what you've done. There's all kinds of reasons that I can give you for mind control, and you know as well as I do that there's all kinds of reasons for it. I mean, there's uh, organizations like the, mob, the Mafia would like to have mind control over people that they uh, rob and, and rape and plunder. Governments would like to have mind control so they don't have to deal with all the goofballs out in the street throwing rocks and that they can control the masses with uh, narcotics, with dope, with a movie, uh, sex, drugs, alcohol, whatever. Give them whatever they want and get them out of here. You know, to pacify them. Uh, yeah, pacify them. Yeah. To not think in a spiritual way. Right. Or, mm. But but what we have known for many many years. I knew this back in the fifties, that. Sex is a tool that can be used. Uh, that that uh, uh, Wilhelm Reich uh, talked about, about the sexual energy and how it can be used to control humans. It can be used to control women and men, but it's, it's a very ancient arcane science. But if you understand what sex is, it can be used in motion pictures, in music, in colors and sound and to control people's thinking. So mm -hmm. I'm just saying, I'm not an expert on this subject, but I know enough about it to know. That's why the porn industry is so successful. That's exactly right. Because the guys that run this planet know mm -hmm. that sex is a seller. Mm -hmm. you know? That's why everything you buy in America has got sex connected to it. Mm -hmm. yeah. What happens to us when we die? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> No doubt about it. And I have to honestly say that I don't know. But uh, I am tending to think that there is something to um, reincarnation. Because all the major religions of the world teach a reincarnation. And it makes sense to me if you are a spirit and in, in living in a human body, a physical body, so the question I asked a long time ago, what are we? Are we a human body that's the home of a spirit living in it? Or were we a spirit to begin with who came into this world and took on a human body? So what are you really? Are you a spirit or are you a physical body? And so now I know. I mean, logic alone tells me that you're a physical body. But I've heard lectures by scientists and doctors who explain what, is, what does the brain do? <clears throat> the brain is not what you think it is. If, if, if you put a table with 50 brains taken from 50 different people and you just put the brains on the table, you're not going to be able to tell anybody from anybody because all the brains look the same. You don't even know the difference between a male and a female. They all look the same. So it's all in the soul. It's all in the spirit. That's right. Personality. That's right. Personality is in the spirit world. Mm -hmm. And the scientist I heard explaining this was a lady scientist and it was very interesting. She said the question was, what does the brain actually do? And she said, we now know that the brain does only one thing only. It, it, it creates and allows for movement. It controls the movement of the brain, the movement of the hands, all of your body functions, where you go, what you're doing. The brain is controlling that. But she said, then she said, but where does your creativity, your spiritual self, where does that come from? Your imagination and dreams at night. Where does that come from? And she said, we know positively. It does not come from the brain. It does not, the brain is physical for the physical body. But you and your spiritual self and who you are and what you think is funny and what you think is, is evil and what you see and what you believe, that's not in your brain. Mm. So if you take the human bodies uh, male bodies, we cut the heads off and you got 50 male bodies there, you'll never know who that body belonged to. Mm. 
And if you take those 50 heads and take the brain out, you'll never know who those brains belong but to. But they all had different personalities. Of course, but they all had per different personalities. Why? Because they don't have nothing to do with the body right. or the brain. They had a he personality, which is the word person. And therefore, your persona, and when you came into your body, when you were born, you have a persona, and therefore we call it a person. Mm -hmm. And so the, you are who you are, but we don't know where, where you get your ideas So let's, from. of course, assume that, that we have a, a soul. I totally believe that, yes. yes. So people who've had near-death experiences right. and who's had out-of-body experiences and even through... I've had them. Yeah. Right? And even who's been in deep meditation and, and other things. Yeah, but yeah. especially people who've been dead. They have seen, they've been through this tunnel, tunnel of light with colors. They went to this um, white light dimension, right. mm -hmm. which a lot of religions refer to as heaven. Yeah. They saw people that had gone before them, family members, and they saw a Jesus figure if they were Christian or Muhammad or whatever, whatever yeah. is the faith that yeah. they believe in. They, have, they see something called the life review. They see everything that they did in their lives. Yep. And then they are asked if they want to correct something or go back in another body mm -hmm. with a wiped memory. Yep. So that's re reincarnation. The phenomena that we call reincarnation is true. There's no doubt about that. But it's very tricky because we know that there have been many, many hundreds of cases where people, kids, young children, would tell you that they were here a thousand years ago and that they saw this king do this and they saw this, they saw that, and they give you, and they tell you exactly where things were and all of that. Memory. And then, yeah, from a memory. And then you find out later on they were right. They went and dug it up and found what they said those kids said was there. And so that obviously they were there. Hmm. No, that's not obvious that they were there. It may be a soul memory, but it doesn't mean that they were there at all. There may be spirit entities, we call angels, mm -hmm. jinns, whatever you want to call these other world entities. And maybe these spirits, what we call angels, maybe they were there 500 years ago, and they saw everything going on. And so today we could take a tape recorder or a digital camera and videotape somebody's voice and hear everything they're saying and forever. That, that you've got them and when they die, 20 years later, you can still show and it looks like them talking. It was them. You recorded it. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying that maybe when we are talking to people who have these wonderful ancient things that have happened to them, no, it didn't happen to you. It happened to one of those archons. It happened to one of those spiritual entities that we call demons, angels, devils, whatever they are, right. whatever these spirits are, and they are putting that into your mind. Like another mind. form of mind control. Precisely. Again. Mm -hmm. And so here you can sit there and talk about all these wonderful experiences you had in Egypt. You were never in Egypt. They were. So people who've had near-death experiences, atheists, people who don't, do not believe in any kind of religion right. or anything, and they don't know each other, a lot of the most of the accounts, they say the same thing. With the tunnel and the white light frequency, is that a real dimension or is it an illusionary dimension? Some people are beginning to suggest that that dimension has been created in a holographic way the same as maybe we are in a sophisticated way here on Earth. A very, very powerful man that I knew who was a dear friend of mine, mm -hmm. okay? And I'm talking about top of the line in this country. Right. A very powerful man. He told me that he had died. He said, I, I, I'll tell you, Jordan, an uh, experience I had about five years ago, this was back in the 90s, he said, I died. I was on the operating table and I died. And he said, and, I, and when I died, I felt myself come out of my body. And I felt just fine. 
and I can hear everybody, I can see what they're doing. I'm watching everything and everybody's running around like a chicken with their head cut off because my, my, my flat line and everybody's trying to save me. I don't need to be saved, I feel fine. I'm just watching all you people running around. And he said, all of a sudden, he told me, all of a sudden I felt myself going backwards into a vortex. Uh, and I had no control over it. It was sucking me into a vortex. And he said, I went down a long tube and I could see a light. And as I was going, there was all kinds of colors as I was spinning around in this tube. This is what this old man told me. And he said that when I came out, there was an angel that met me. When I came out of the, uh, uh, the tube, an angel met me and said, turn around, you go back. And I'm supposed to be here, turn around and go back. And he said, why? And he said, because one of us, one of ours is down there and you have to go help him. So turn around, you've got a job to do. And he said, I felt uh, without any, uh, I didn't do it. It was uh, uh, automatic. I just got sucked back into the vortex and I went back down through and back down through until I came back into the operating room. And he says, I came back as I started going in my body, yeah. consciously, I, I came back and I was looking around and I saw everybody running around, and then when I felt myself go back into my body, everybody started running around because now my vital signs are coming back. Mm -hmm. I'm coming back into my body. That's very similar to what a lot, a lot of people have said yeah. that they experienced. And exactly. so he said, so I'm telling you, I did that. Mm -hmm. That I went through the tunnel and saw the angel and he told me to come back. So he believes in that, that that is the end goal, to go to the white light because he saw the, the he saw the angel, well, from but what? is it to, to be in that karma wheel all the time? We won't get out of the matrix. Yeah, I understand. If we can consciously go back again to the body, or we can consciously go to somewhere else, can we choose not to go into that if it is a constructive deception? But you see, I'm not in a position to answer that because I don't know. I have gone out of my body and I have way too many friends around the world that have told me about their experience of going out of their body and going through tubes and seeing the light. Very similarly. And, Very, and yeah. I've also talked to people who say, don't go to the light because they're just going to re, re, you know, package Recycle, you and, yeah. and you go back into the system again. Mm -hmm. and, so, <clears throat> and, I, and so I asked them, well, if I don't go into the light, where, where would I go? Because if these spirits that, that you talk about, yeah. if, they can, if they can deceive us here, why, why wouldn't they be able to do that just well, in, a, of course. In, a, in, a, in a dimension just well, a little bit course. about that? Obviously, of course. What we have to really find out is where to go consciously when we leave the body. Wherever it is you go, you need to keep in mind that whoever is in charge of you going anywhere, they're in charge, not you. But do you think that our consciousness can be controlled? But if you were a spirit in a physical body and that in another spirit world was contacting you and telling you to go out and do these things, mm -hmm. it's not contacting your physical body, it's contacting your spirit. Mm -hmm. And your spirit is now being talked to by a higher spirit. Well, when you die and your spirit leaves your body, so it's no big deal. They talk to your spirit all the time. Unless you're, you're becoming conscious about it now. Yes, but What I'm is saying, happening? Yeah. So what, what do you think, finally here, to wrap up, what do you think is the most important thing for people to do when they hear all of these things? Some people may hear, hear them for, for the first time. Yeah. And all of the stuff that you're talking about and that we, went, we, we discussed today. I mean, there should be some hope there. There should be something positive to come out of all of this. What, do you, what is your message to people? What do you think uh, people should well, do? First of all, your mind is like a parachute. Your mind is like a parachute. It don't work if it's not open. First. Second of all, I have people who tell me, well, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. And I say, yes, it's a train coming. Well, so don't tell me oh, everything's going to be just fine. No, it's not going to be just fine. The whole world, as one astronomer said, the universe is not stranger than you imagine. It's stranger than you can imagine. 
There are things going on out there you have no idea in the world what's going on. But if we suspect that that is true, what is the best thing or the most positive thing that we can do when learning about these things? I think the, the scripture says, know the truth and the truth will set you free. I think that that is a very important point that needs to be made. Open your mind. The world is not what you think it is. I can guarantee you nothing on this earth works the way you think it does. There's an old term that the world works on smoke and mirrors. <clears throat> well, when I was a kid, I used to think, what are you talking about smoke and mirrors? I mean, if you walk out in front of a bus and you get run over, that wasn't smoke and mirrors, that's real. So what are you talking about the world works on smoke and mirrors? Well, now I understand the term. It means deception. The words and terms and ideas that are told to you when you were growing up, that's not true, but they're deception. And so the world you come up into and grow into is filled with smoke and mirrors, symbolically meaning when you look at something, no, you're looking at yourself as a mirror. And then you look over here to a, 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 an attorney or, or an expert to tell you this, and he's telling you something, that's a bunch of smoke. What is the best thing we can do? Even when we say the truth will set us free, well, which is right. <clears throat> yeah. But how, how, can we, how can we go on from there? The first thing is first. You need to, for the first time in your life, understand completely what humility means. Because if you're arrogant and you know everything there is to know about everything and you don't need to hear all this other nonsensical stuff, talk audibly to the great spirit. I do believe in God. I do believe there is a spirit in the universe. Which is good? Yes, which is good. Which, well, it does, it's not good. It is just what it is. God says through the prophet Isaiah, <clears throat> I create good. I create evil. I create life, I create death. I create wars and violence, I create peace. I create it all. I'm God and I can do whatever I want to. Sometimes I... So is there any hope for the human race and for our spirits? Um, I tend to think that the history of the human race has taught us that uh, there's not any hope for the whole human race. But... For those who want more, more will be added. Those who want to know will begin to learn things they're supposed to know. Certain people will learn what they want to know. It will be given to them. As I have what is called faith. But faith is not what Christians think it is. Whatever is supposed to happen, it will. Whatever you're supposed to learn, you will. If you're not supposed to, you won't. So I, I, I'm just saying that the world is far, far different than what you think it is. And not like that astronomer said, the universe is not only stranger than you imagine, it's stranger than you can imagine. There is a world of topics and subjects and things that we could talk about for hours. There are so many things. It's so complicated. It's very complex. It's very fascinating. It's wild, shocking, and everything. Yeah. For now, unfortunately, we do not have more time. But I want to thank you very much, Jordan Maxwell, for doing this interview with Age of Truth Well, I'm, TV. I was honored that you would think enough of me to ask me to do it. And I thank you. I thank you. Thank you very much. Pleasure. <laughs>